Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the chance to talk to you today about network attack surface simplification for red and blue teams. Some work that my advisor, Dr. Chang, and I did. This is what we'll be talking about today, a little bit about myself before we talk about the attack surface in general. Then we'll go over the problem and our solution and the detailed technique. Then we'll talk about the data set we used and we'll go over a quick case study, uh, followed by some measuring of the attack surface and finally wrapping up with our future work and what's in it for you. So a little bit about me, I have a varied background. I started as a military intelligence officer in the Air Force. And as part of that time, I spent teaching information warfare for about two years. This information as a target is something we would attack and also is something we need to defend. It gave me a very interesting perspective as I moved on in my career to a security compliance auditor and a pen tester for the government. And I am currently an offensive security test team lead for a Fortune 500 company. Uh, that means I run a pen test team and a red team. And we're going to talk a little bit about these teams in a little bit. And I'm also in my spare time a uh, computer science student at Clemson University. So let's talk about the attack surface. I like to use a castle or a house analogy for the attack surface to talk about the doors and the windows and all the ways that someone might try to get into your house. And that's the key. Just because the point is on the attack surface, it doesn't mean it has a vulnerability. However, the attack surface does contain the set of all known and unknown vulnerabilities. I want to emphasize that because there are many different ways to define an attack surface. And for our research, not every point on the surface is a vulnerability. That's the job of testers like me to find. So the attack surface is that set of all points on a target that can be used to access or impact the target. So who cares about attack surfaces? Well, let's talk about red teams for a minute. The job of a red team is to emulate a threat and test the processes and protection mechanisms in an organization to really see what they do if a real APT or another real adversary came up against them. And they exploit the attack surface to do that. Now the pen test team is more of a vulnerability hunting team. So they want to explore the entire attack surface, look at it and see if there are actually any vulnerabilities they can find. So they need to know the attack surface to make sure either they test the whole thing or at least they know what they tested and what they didn't. And of course the blue team's job is to defend the attack surface, uh, to detect and prevent attacks on that surface from either a red team or a real adversary. And last but certainly not least, application developers need to be aware of this attack surface so they can minimize it. The idea is you want to present as small of an attack surface as possible, as simple of an attack surface as you can, while still providing the services you want to provide to your customer. And that's why the attack surface is important. Now, there are so many different ways and dimensions to define this attack surface, but for our research, we just looked at the network only, specifically the TCP ports. So this excludes everything else. It excludes UDP ports, things like SNMP and you know the less reliable forms of transmission. Basically everything above and below the OSI layer four. We're just talking about networking, no physical security, no social engineering, uh, not the application level things. For this research, we just focused on those open and closed TCP ports. So to map that, we just have to detect the open TCP ports on an attack surface because an opening port means a listening process. And a listening process is part of the attack surface, and that's how we define it. Now, for our purposes here, there are two main ways to do this. Using a tool like Nmap or MassScan, uh, you can actually run an active port scan on a device or an application, multiple servers or just one server, and it will return a list of all the open ports for you. And Nmap can also provide you a lot more information, banners and service detection, and it has a scripting engine that does so much more. There's also Shodan, the search engine for the Internet of Things. Now, you don't actually do the search yourself in this instance. Shodan has done it for you. You're just querying their database, as you can see here, where I've done a query for port 8080. And that's a great thing that Shodan does for you. And we use Shodan for our project because you don't have to actually do any scanning, which is a questionable ethical area for some people. So what's the problem we tried to solve? Well, the attack surface is huge. Even if you're talking about just the external servers, it's just huge. 
there's so many services exposed to the internet. And if you're talking about internal services, it's even bigger. Remember, your application is just one part of the attack surface. So there's a lot going on there. Now, there's also shape and depth problems. We just narrowed our scope. But if we hadn't, we'd also be talking about things like network protocols, you know, fuzzing in the operating system level. Uh, what about those shrink-wrapped apps like Apache Web Server, IIS, um, FTP servers, things like that with possible vulnerabilities in them. And also the higher level up applications, uh, things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, vulnerabilities in the actual applications themselves. So as you can see, the attack, attack surface gets really complicated really quickly. So how do we exploit or test or defend such a large space? How do we meet that scale? Well, I've always been a big fan of manual testing. Since I started pen testing, I love taking tools like Burp Proxy Suite or Netcat and literally sending the request by hand to the application. Now this works great. I have a lot of control and I get to use what I've learned and be creative, use that human creativity, but it's slow. I like to think of this like building a house with a screwdriver and a hammer bit by bit and contrast that building a house by telling a contractor you want them to build a house for you. Look, you can choose the color of the walls and maybe that's about it, what goes on the floor. You don't have a lot of control and that's how it is with automatic scanners. They scan it their way and you might be able to tweak some settings, but really they do it their way and it's automatic. So it doesn't necessarily have that human ingenuity. So there's this big gap in the middle I call the semi-automatic gap. And in an ideal world, I'd like to take my skills with a screwdriver and a hammer and use power tools instead, automate where I can. So how do we get that precision of manual tools with the speed of the automatic scanners? Well, this is our solution and it's very simple and straightforward. We cluster hosts that are similar and this allows us to repeat techniques on those hosts. Theoretically, if hosts are similar enough in a cluster, I can use the same techniques and that means scripting and that means saving a bunch of time. It also highlights the outliers, hosts that may be a little bit different that I wanna try different techniques on. And that gives me a big advantage when it comes to testing in terms of speed and effectiveness. So let's dive into the details of our technique. The first thing is to take an organization level and identify all the open ports that are exposed to the internet across all the servers. So you can see here an example, and this is the same one that we used in the case study later. And then we identify the hosts that are open frequently above a certain threshold so that we can see what are the most popular ports in the organization. Sometimes there are only a few, sometimes there are a bunch, it just depends. But you can see here that there were four ports that were most popular and not surprisingly, they're web, DNS, and FTP, which is not that uncommon. So we have two ways of measuring. So what we do is for every host in that organization, we create two vectors, one with a true and false for every port that's open against that first long vector of all ports in the organization. And the second I call the frequent ports vector, which only covers those four frequent ports. And four in this case, it varies from organization to organization. So you have two vectors to define each host. So what you do with that then is you compute the similarity between the vectors. Now, if you can, you use the shorter frequent ports vector, unless there's nothing open there. Most of the time, that's not true by definition, but occasionally you'll find an odd server that doesn't have a frequent port open. In that case, you fall back to the longer vector and you compute the similarity that way. And you end up with a, essentially the cross product similarity of every cross product of hosts. So you get an idea of which hosts are similar. And then you cluster all the hosts that are above a given minimum similarity. We used uh, 90% 0.90 in this exercise. And you can see what happens. You get a really cool listing and grouping of servers. Then the next thing is we take a look at each of these clusters and anything that is not exactly like the others in the cluster is marked as an intra-cluster outlier. And this means it was close enough to be clustered, but there's something different about it. And we need to pay attention or we might miss something. So in the end, you have three groups. You have the clusters. Inside the clusters, you have intra-cluster outliers. They're just a little bit different. And then you have the true outliers that just couldn't be clustered. And with all that, you have a great picture of the attack surface.
So I want to talk about the data set that we use, 13 different organizations, um, none of which are represent current or former employers. They're just organizations that are popular that we picked off the Shodan search engine. And what we did was we changed the name. This information is all available to you if you want to query Shodan, but I don't want to imply that there are any vulnerabilities. We're just looking at the attack surface here. Um, and we looked at the hosts and the ports, and we collected open TCP ports. Now, Shodan is kind enough to give us a CSV export, which includes a lot more information than we used, banner information, which we're going to get to in our future work. So what we have is a case study here. We're a red team. We're targeting this financial company that you see highlighted here, and we want to emulate a realistic threat that wants to quietly gain a, thre a threshold on the internal network. So... This is what it looks like when run through our algorithm, and you can already see the clusters taking shape. Well, let's take a look and see how a red team might look at this data. Well, first, this outlier down here stands out. Unusual ports, maybe they're web services, but it's worth a look. Doesn't look like things that maybe should be internet facing, but we'll take a look and see. Next, I've got these non-80 and 443 web servers. I really want to take a close look at those because they could be administrative interfaces. They might have default passwords worth looking into. SSH is next. I've possibly got some secure file transfer and also some admin access sites. See, I've got those two servers that are not uh, just FTP. They're FTP and SSH, so maybe there's more valuable information on them. And then I want to focus on this 443 only first. Why? Well, because it's odd that it doesn't have 80 open too. Most customer-facing websites have 80 open, even if it just redirects you to 443 immediately, because it might be bad for customer experience. So it's more likely these are private sites and thus more interesting. So now we have an attack plan. An important thing about this is that blue team and app teams, you should take a look and see how a red team sees your application, sees your infrastructure network from their perspective, because this will help you shape your attack surface and defend your attack surface and build your application to be less susceptible to attack. Now, one of the other things that we've done is attack surface complexity, and this is simply a measure so that you can put a number on how complicated the attack surface is. Now, admittedly, just using TCP ports, this isn't as accurate as I would like, but the point is this lays down a framework that you can use, and as you add more data, it will fit nicely in the framework. The idea is that outliers are one, clusters are one, plus basically a factor of how large those clusters are. So it gives you an idea of how complicated an organization's attack surface is, and you can see here some examples of what we've done where it doesn't necessarily matter how many hosts and ports are open, but it is the complexity. It is how easily they were clustered and how similar they were. And this will be even more valuable as we add more data in, which is our future work. We want to climb to the top of the OSI model. We want to look at that application layer data, use those banner responses to cluster so that we can combine uh, servers that are running similar software, similar FTP servers, etc. The internal network is very complicated, but we want to tackle it and use these techniques to cluster the massive number of servers in these large corporate networks. And finally, we want to dive into web applications. If we can look at that front page of a web application, what can we figure out? It's a benign query. We can make it without feeling like we're hacking or port scanning aggressively, and we can get that data. Can we improve the current state of the art on this service detection? So here's the idea. You've got an attack surface, okay? Your application is part of that attack surface. The red teams and APTs and threat actors are going to attack it. The pen test teams are going to come at it and test it test every square inch of the attack service that they can find. And the blue teams are going to have to defend it. So knowing how your application is viewed, assessed, and attacked by these adversary groups will hopefully help you build a better, more secure application. I want to thank you again for your time. Have a good afternoon.